So as I said, childhood anxiety, two words that should not be paired together. When you think of childhood, you think of, right, a time of being carefree, filled with excitement, filled with hope. Therefore, to talk about anxiety or a, a crushing burden of fear within that special season of life is, is really heartbreaking. But yet it's a sad reality that even our children, our teenagers, um, are not exempt from this. So even in this area of life, as uh, Dr. Kelderman spoke about, our children are not spared from the re harsh reality that we live in this fallen and broken world and that we are broken by the effects of sin and that some of our children to varying degrees are going to struggle with these things like fear and anxiety. Just a few facts and statistics uh, between the years 2016 and 2019 anxiety and depression were becoming more common among children and adolescents increasing 20 percent just within those three years by 2020, 5.6 million kids had been diagnosed. So this, these are just those diagnosed. 5.6 million kids diagnosed with anxiety problems and 2.4 million diagnosed with depression. According to one study, the prevalence of depression and anxiety symptoms during COVID-19 doubled a lot of these numbers. So even with our children, teenagers, the pandemic has had this very similar effect that it has had on the adults. We've seen an increase in anxiety, fear, depression. Children within the church are not exempt from this reality. And um, to quote our family pediatrician back in Grand Rapids, she said, many children, even in Christian homes, fight significant battles with anxiety. Some will clearly articulate their worrying thoughts. Others will have more subtle signs such as repetitive questions for assurance, trouble falling asleep, angry outbursts, or physical symptoms such as stomach aches or headaches. So even children within the church are not exempt from this reality. But my goal today is not to spend my time on facts and statistics as important as those are to know. Um, because as some of you know, maybe you're here because your own child struggles with this, or maybe you're here because you work with children who do, right? It's an entirely, it's entirely one thing to talk about the facts, but then when you are painfully watching your own child or children you know fight this battle, whether it be depression, panic attacks, it's, it's difficult. Um, you can feel so helpless, right? You want to take this burden from off your children or from off the, ch the child, and um, it's, it's a real struggle. So. My, my goal today is twofold. First, just to share um, our own personal experience with a child who struggles with anxiety and panic attacks. And then to also give you some strategies that we have learned, that we have gleaned from uh, dealing with this uh, over the years and how to help children um, fight this fear and anxiety. So our oldest daughter, Anna, she's nine and a half now. And um, even as a little girl, she was always more of like cautious, a little bit fearful. That was sort of her general disposition. She wasn't one who was going to, you know, see how close she could stand to the edge of the road. Her personality would always be, I'm going to stand further back. So she was always a bit more cautious, even as a toddler. But then two events happened in her young life, which began to trigger, trigger very abnormal levels of fear and anxiety, right? All children to some degree will deal with some fear and worry, right? I'm scared of the dark or that's just normal. But we began to see in Anna that these levels were becoming abnormal. So the two events that happened first was um, an occasion where we had to stab her with an EpiPen. So she has an allergic reaction to nuts, anaphylactic reaction. And um, her throat was beginning to close up, right? We had to stab her with the needle, the ambulance had to come. Very traumatic for a little girl. I think she was about maybe three at the time or two, two or three. Um, and she, she still vividly remembers that event. Second event that happened shortly um, after 2016, she was about three and a half and her and my husband uh, went to the bank. They were, we were about to eat supper and my husband was gonna go on a quick errand. He said, I'll take Anna with me. 
and just a few minutes from our house they were involved in a very serious car accident so my husband was he was knocked out for a short time and when he woke up he was also very disoriented so anyway the firefighter had to take Anna out so imagine this firefighter in all garb <laughs> coming to this three and a half year old taking her out of the vehicle um, her daddy is kind of not really with it at the time um, she saw the ambulance take him away of course I was stuck at home with my other little ones um, thankfully my aunt you know took her home so these two events in her very young life, all happening before three and a half, um, were very traumatic for her and began to um, cause some very abnormal levels of fear um, and anxiety. Now, j just a side note here. Um, I, again, I recognize that there are, there are many factors that can cause fear and anxiety in children. So I'm kind of just focusing on one um, avenue here today, but um, I just want to acknowledge them, you know, learning disabilities, environment, circumstances, many different factors. Um, uh, but trauma is definitely one of them and probably like according, like when I did some research, probably one of the top uh, causes in fear and anxiety in children, some type of traumatic event um, that happened in their life. Um, as one study says, it's normal for children to feel worried or anxious from time to time. Right, such as when they're starting school or nursery or moving to a new area. But for some children, anxiety affects their behavior and thoughts every day, interfering with school and home and social life. And that's what we began to see in Anna. This was beginning to um, really uh, debilitate her from living, living life. So how did some of this struggle uh, manifest itself? Uh, I'll give you some examples. Um, extreme fear of being away from us. So say she was in the playroom and she could see me. If I walked, say, into another room where she couldn't see me, extreme panic, very extreme panic. Um, fear of trying anything new, whether it be a new food or going to a new place. Um, insomnia, bedtime became a real struggle. Struggle to fall asleep, extremely afraid to go to bed. Uh, stomach aches. She had an abnormal concern for the safety of her siblings. So, um, for example, if her younger brother James was sucking on a lollipop, she would freak out and grab the lollipop from him. He's going to choke. He's going to choke. And I would have to say to her, Anna, you know, mommy is responsible for James. I'm not going to, you know. But she had this feeling of intense responsibility for the safety um, of her siblings. Um, we would all be eating outside on the deck, enjoying hamburgers, and she would eat inside, terrified of the bees. So again, you can see how this was beginning to interfere in just normal daily living. Um, so she struggled on and off with, with this, um, sometimes low level, sometimes a little bit higher. But then in 2020, she began to deal with uh, severe panic attacks. Um, <laughs> The only trigger that we can think was that there was a, a cricket in her bed, and <laughs> which, yeah, I, I personally would not like that either. I, I don't like bugs. But anyway, that just ever since that happened, like for that was that's all we could think of that could could have been the trigger. Um, she began to experience severe panic attacks. So prior to that, she had never had a panic attack, um, and these attacks could last for up to one hour whole body would be shaking. Um, she would be saying, I, I, I can't breathe. I'm going to die. Uh, it, was, it was awful. It was really, really hard. Um, and as parents, we felt really helpless. Um, particularly myself, it was very heartbreaking because I struggle with panic attacks and anxiety. And so to see my child having a panic attack was, was very hard. And um, just knowing how how can I help her? Um, so I'll talk about Anna a little bit more uh, later. And she, she's doing much better today by, by God's grace. Uh, she no longer has those severe panic attacks. Um, still a struggle for her. But um, again, I'll kind of come back, come back to that later. So what are some lessons we learned from this experience? What are some strategies? Because, you know, as a parent, I... I knew all these beautiful biblical truths and promises, right? And 
I struggled. How can I, how can I help my little girl apply these practically? Because as you know, children are very concrete, right? It's one thing to say, the Bible says fear not. Right? But how in, in a three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old mind, how do you enable them to practically um, apply that? Um, so I think it's very key that you have an open conversation with your child or, or the children that you know, right? Tell them how the Bible speaks about fear. Um, David, right? He's one of our heroes of the faith. He had the courage to kill the giant Goliath. What does he say in Psalm 56? Whenever I am afraid. Notice he didn't say, if I ever become afraid. No, whenever I am afraid. David had fear. David was afraid. I will trust in God. So talk about it. Show them how that even men of God within God's word struggled with fear. They had fear. Avoid minimizing their fear or anxiety. It's important to validate. Validate the reality of it. Validate the reality of their physical symptoms. Maybe whether it be a stomach ache or a, or a headache. And there is a bit of a balancing act here between validating and perpetuating. Because um, I, I would notice with Anna too, like if I, if I kind of focus too much on, oh, I know it's okay. Yes, this is awful, scary. I would almost see her anxiety increase. So it was that balancing act between like, no, it's okay, and, you know, distraction, and you don't need to be afraid. So it's, that is, I recognize that that's a balan balancing act there, but I do think it's important we, va we validate it, because if we don't, they're no longer going to have an open conversation with us, right? If we continue to shut them down, oh, that's ridiculous, you don't need to be afraid of that, or why are you anxious, like, just get over it. They're going to shut down, right? And they're not going to feel that they can talk to us about that. Share your own struggle. If you yourself perhaps struggle with fear, worry, and anxiety, what a great opportunity to share that with your child, right? And, and um, how the Lord uh, helps you. So again, as adults, we know that the Bible has so many beautiful promises, right? But how do we help our children understand and apply them? So I would like to share with you a three-step process that we found helpful. Um, Number one, communicate. So communicate the truth of God's word. Speak the truth of God's word. Don't stop there. Second one, consider with them biblical and real life examples. Okay, stories, stories. Um, so again, I, as I just said earlier, I gave you the example of David. And there's many other. Um, depending on their age, right? We heard about William Cooper last night, you know, so even from history. Um, so use biblical real life examples. And then the third one here, and this is what we found to be most critical was concretely apply the truth. Again, children are very concrete. And we're going to kind of look at some ways that we can do that. So communicate the truth of God's word, consider with them biblical and other um, examples from life, and then concretely apply the truth. So let me just give you sort of an example of how we might have gone about this. So again, there are many truths. I'm just going to pick one right now. Truth number one, whenever I am afraid, I can trust that God is everywhere. Right? It's a beautiful truth. Now, three or four-year-old, of course, you know, they, they, even, they even struggle with that concept that God is everywhere. Right? I can't see God. Um, and he's, you're telling me he's here. He's with me. He's everywhere. So, okay. First step, if Anna was here, okay, Anna, the Bible says, fear not, for I am with you, right? There's the truth. You're not alone. God in his word says that. Proverbs 15, verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place. That includes where you are right now. Okay. Examples. A lot of scary things happened to David. Remember how he had to protect his sheep and a bear and how King Saul tried to kill him? But David could fight his fear because he knew God was with him. Right? Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Right? David was not afraid. Why? Because God was with him. Just like as he was a shepherd with his sheep. So there you're using example, right? An example from the Bible. Um, in, in this instance. 
So now the third step, okay, how can, how can, what's a concrete way for your child to understand this? And again, this, it, depending on the age, um, first you also need to ask them questions, right? So when do you feel alone and scared? What makes you afraid? So you have to help them personalize it. Um, one concrete application of this would be writing out these Bible verses, coloring them together, right, as you're talking. Um, Hang it on a piece of paper, put it on the wall, put it by their bed. Perhaps if they're a bit older, they can write these verses on note cards, right? Put them in their backpack, put it in your pocket, <coughs> and take it out. Um, so something tangible, something they can hold, something concrete. Now, Anna, when she was like two or three, of course, you know, she's not writing, she's not reading. So we kind of like, okay, how can we help her here? So what, one thing that we did... Um, the Bible verse, right, that talks about how God holds our hand, right, our right hand. So we had a picture in her wall of just like a, a big hand, like a father's hand, just a hand with a little child's hand holding it. We just put that right by her bed, just as a visual, and that, that helped her as a visual of when she saw that. That's right, it's just a reminder, right, that God holds our hands, just like a father, father's strong hand is holding the hand of a child. So some other uh, practical, concrete um, things that you can do. Um, 2 Corinthians 10.5, right, talks about taking our thoughts captive. Um, so how can you apply that to a child, right? You could say, now, imagine that you're grabbing your fear, right, putting it into a jail. Maybe you actually get a little box with a lock and a key. Right? And you write, you have the child. Okay, let's write out your fears. What are you worried about? What are you anxious about? Take it, let's put it in the box. We're going to lock it. We're going to take it captive. Right? A concrete way to apply that biblical verse of taking our thoughts captive. Um, if you have little boys who like to fish, right? How about the verse, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you, right? Maybe you actually get a fishing pole, <laughs> little fishing pole, you know, and Practice that, you know, casting, right? Um, casting it far away, as far as you can into the lake. That's what the Bible's telling you to do with your fear, with your worry. Cast it upon the Lord. So again, a concrete way, a hands-on way for them to <coughs> understand these biblical truths. Um, for some kids, maybe it's making a little stop sign, right? And again, as, as they get older, some of these examples, you don't need to maybe actually have a physical little stop sign in their hand, right? You can talk about these, but, you know, for a two or three year old, little stop sign that when you have that voice in your head, that, that bully, that fear bully, get out that stop sign, right? And you say stop to that worrying thought. Um, another idea, you have a backpack, right? Go get a bunch of rocks, put it in the child's backpack, right? You try to put that backpack, man, that's heavy, right? And that's what, right? That's what their fear and anxiety is doing to them, right? Let's, you know what, let's take out these rocks, right? And with, with each anxiety, with each worry, we take these rocks, we pray, Lord, I'm so worried about this or that. Help me to trust you. I'm going to give this to you, right? And eventually empty, empty that backpack, right? Because you don't want to carry a backpack filled with all of those rocks. Uh, scripture memory. Memorize those verses. And um, that's, that's something I so appreciate about this school. And even when I was growing up, in fact, I say to my kids, I wish when I was growing up, I took Bible memory more seriously, <laughs> you know, where I really committed it to memory because that's, that's going to be a very helpful tool, especially if they're in a situation where they're not by you or where they can't open the word of God or maybe get out their card. If they have these scripture verses memorized in their mind, the Lord can, the Lord can use that. Now, in some cases, um, Children may need some medication. Um, I don't want to ignore that, that fact. Um, in the case of Anna, we did have to put her um, on a low dose anxiety medication. And that was hard for me at first, um, partly, which I, I don't know why, because I myself am on a medication. But yet, yeah, somehow when I thought my, my little child, like, no, like, she shouldn't have to deal with this. She shouldn't have to be on medication for this but again 
you have to recognize that for some kids, like Anna was at the point, uh, it was debilitating. I mean, almost every night to have an hour long panic attack, her body shaking, awful, right? And this is constantly going on. She's not sleeping, right? And of course, that's going to affect, you don't get enough sleep, your anxiety is going to be worse, right? And so thankful, I'm so thankful for our um, family pediatrician back in Michigan. Um, she was a Christian doctor and, you know, she said, um, as my husband mentioned too, right now, like we need to fix Anna's glasses, right? Her, her brain, her brain can't even process right now, fear not, for I am with you. Um, we, we first need to, we need to get her to a point where we can teach her strategies. Because oh, I was trying all the strategies, you know, like the, okay, you know, deep breaths, you know, pretend you're smelling hot chocolate and then <sighs> blowing it out. It, it would just, it, nothing was, she was just on like, like this. Um, so God blessed, God blessed that means. And um, her mind, her body began to heal, strengthen. And then we got to a point where we could really begin to teach her and to apply these strategies. Um, so thankfully right now, she, she is not. She's been off now, off the medication. Um, and uh, we can see that, again, it's, it's still there. It's a struggle for her, but she has learned to be able to, to cope. She's learned to be able to take these strategies and help her deal with um, the fear um, and anxiety. Um, and then, I still have some time here. I think, too, it's, it's important um, to recognize that as heartbreaking as this is, to watch your children deal with this or children that you know, what a gospel opportunity it can be too, right? Um, an opportunity to tell your children about Jesus and why they need Jesus, why they need the hope of the gospel. Um, and that if they, if they have Jesus, right? If, if Jesus is their Lord and Savior, they don't have to even fear death, right? Um, there, because Jesus will take you to be with him where there is no more fear, where there is no more pain, where there is no more suffering. So we, we really, as we kind of look back on that time, it was very hard to see it as we were walking through those days. Um, but as we look back on it now, we see, yeah, wow, we, how many opportunities we had with Anna, almost more so than with our other children, to just speak the gospel to her, speak the truth, bring her to Jesus, um, pray with her, and um, an encouragement to see the fruit, the fruit of that as well in, in Anna's life. Um, does anybody have any, I know there's going to be a question time later, or um, any other strategies? I know, you know, Carrie Ann, you work with children here at school, and um, so feel free to use this time if anybody wants to share something of their own story, maybe with children that they have. Um, we'd be open to have a discussion here. Yes? Um, when your daughter Anna was young and she had this epidemic. Yes. She was two or three. I think, so. yeah, about that. And that was the onset of her condition. Correct. Um, were you at that point already explaining to her that um, she should trust in the Lord and, and really go biblical on her. Because I've had mm -hmm. um, children that have, and I've had grandchildren that have, um, but I, I, I quote different, I'm not saying that yours is bad, but God is there. Mm -hmm. God gives us parents mm -hmm. the gift of children. Yes. We have your baptism, mm -hmm. say, you'll raise them in the fear of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Can we not then say, because you're using pictures and verse okay, to make things very tangible for mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. But would I be wrong in saying God has given me the duty of being your protector here? Mm -hmm. So come sit with me. Right, yeah. God has given me this duty, yeah. and I will fulfill that duty to the best yeah. of my ability. So they have something yeah. tangible. For sure. That they can hug, yeah. that they can hold, that they can yeah. put their head on the shoulder. Absolutely. To calm. Yeah. Oh, for sure. As a parent, you have to be present through all of this, right? Absolutely. I, I mean, yeah, we would, during Anna's panic attacks, we didn't leave her side. 
and right? Our kids we were her holding her hand. We were yeah. hugging her. We were there, right? But I'm saying this because at a younger age, can you can you make that make sense to them? Mm -hmm. Like at three and four, and then as they get older, while they're dealing with you, can start to explain more so that there's more comprehension about the God they don't see, right? But the God that they can. That's right. Yes. Dreaming. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. So yes, for for a two year old. You as being the parent or the grandparent is going to be very important of just just your presence there, right? But I don't think it's too young to just during that time to just be speaking God's yes. truth, just as we teach them yes. little songs or even and um, yeah even singing. I, I didn't mention that here. That was a key one when she was little. Songs like. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. The Steve Green, I think, or, you know, those Bible verses. So, yes, I, I agree with you that um, as God has given us also that, that role to be the hands and feet of Christ to them. Um, and that we are one way in which we can help them tangibly understand that. And so, yeah, that's a, a very good point. Very good point. So you have younger children. I wonder how you would speak to, to older ones. Like I work with older kids and yeah. the teenagers that maybe feel like that's like a more babyish way to For sure. Things. For so sure. how do you speak to older kids that are dealing with anxiety and depression without yeah. like speaking down mm -hmm. about them? Maybe they're more resistant to it too. So I know there is a, a book on the table here by Dr. David Murray that specifically deals with teenage um, anxiety and depression. So I would highly recommend that. Um, I feel like I can't really speak to that too much just because I'm not, I'm not there yet. Um, and even in when I, I did teach high school, but didn't really deal with any of that at the time. Now, from my own personal experience as deal as like an, as an adult in dealing with anxiety, um, Even for myself, like physically writing out a list of things, like um, I remember the one time writing out my fears and putting a column and on the next side, the truth of God's word, right? Um, so I think there's, there's still tangible ways that like say our young adults, even adults can use that wouldn't be babyish, say like pictures <coughs> or, or coloring. Um, but again, uh, it, it, the, the timing of that is also critical because um, when I was in the height of an anxiety attack, um, my husband could speak scripture to me all he wanted. It was not, it was going in one and out, it, you know. Um, so at that point, I, I needed, I just needed him to be there, right? Hold my hand, whatever it might be. Um, and then afterwards, begin to apply the, the truth of God's word. So I don't, Carrie Ann, can you maybe, do you work with, some of the teenagers, yeah, can you? I with some teenagers, mostly younger Can students. you speak, can you speak to that at um, all? Yeah, I, I agree with what you said. Like, there are still tangible ways. Um, maybe you can, like, bring in, I don't know, like, historical characters yeah. or people that they know and teach, like, what, like, maybe even reading books and walk, looking at how someone walked through different experiences and how they dealt with it. Um, I, I like what you said about like writing what you're feeling mm -hmm. and then responding with like, so like my thoughts say and God says yes. this. Um, I think in a way it doesn't require as much creativity in right. with teenagers yep. because they are able to grasp those um, the abstract. concepts, yes. the abstract concepts. Yeah. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, even playing off like their own interests yeah. and their own, yeah. Maybe they're interested mm -hmm. in soccer, so then you can somehow tie it into mm -hmm. soccer. I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah. And just kind of going off of that, like finding something that they are very interested in can be very helpful. And then, mm -hmm. like, so for Anna, it was music, playing the piano. Um, you know, finding those things that do bring them relaxation. And that's going to be different for every child. That's where, you know, you as a parent, in a sense, are going to know best, right? Um, what your child um, would respond to well, mm -hmm. um, and then to you know encourage them, encourage them to do that. And there and there are very physical things um, that you know even even in the secular world that they recommend that also 
are, are good for us to tell our children to do too, right? As long as we do it within a biblical, you know, bi biblical perspective, you know, distraction methods. Okay, think about, think about five things. What's something you see? What's something you feel? What's something you hear? You know, to distract their mind from their racing heart rate, rate or the feeling that they can't breathe. Um, for little ones, you know, blowing bubbles. Um, having them chase after a, a, a bubble. Um, uh, I know with, with Anna, something that would help her, if, especially if she was, say, in a, in a classroom setting. Because like, as, as she gets older, right, then she starts to get this, like, well, I don't want everybody to know that I'm feeling anxious, right? So how do I deal with this? You know, and just, you know, she would go with each hand and just kind of go down her fingers, you know, and then by eventually by the time she would reach this hand, she generally would find that, okay, she would um, calm down a bit. Um, so I think it's important to to teach them those uh, those strategies too, like the hot cocoa one that that came from our uh, our doctor. You know, pretend you're holding hot chocolate. Breathe that in. And, you know, breathe it out. Um, all of those little things are also uh, beneficial for for children. Yes. So I got a son. He'd uh, uh, he'd be horrible in the classroom setting. Mm. Uh, he'd be looking at this. Since uh, no, no, that's not how it's spelt. That would get on his nerves, and he'd get so anxious over that. that yeah. Uh, he wouldn't be able to focus on anything else. Uh, and then my wife, she has anxiety issues as well, so like you. Yeah. Um, and so it's trying to, uh, I have a balancing act at mm -hmm. home on mm -hmm. dealing with his issues mm -hmm. where he'll get so overwhelmed, he'll get where he'll start acting out. Yeah. And he'll start, yes. he'll get angry, he'll mm -hmm. get all those things. And so dealing with that and then dealing with, the wife at the same time as she starts to get all that overwhelmed yes. because of that. Yes. So, uh, like, how do I get it where he's not nitpicking on the small things like that? Like, it's missing the E. Mm -hmm. It can't be missing E. You got to put the E in. If the E is not there, we can't do anything else. Until the E is there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say probably, you know, trying to redirect, but that I know that that can't that that can't always work, and that's where like, again, there's there's so many nuances and facets um, to to childhood anxiety. You know, perhaps there's another uh, maybe something else going on that's who knows even you know some children if with their eyes right or their their headaches or um, if they're having dyslexia right. And that can sometimes cause um, anxiety. So um, I'm not sure how to specifically say how to help him with um, sort of the focusing on, on those little details. Um, but I guess it would be trying to find, okay, what are ways that enable him to calm down and try to use that in the situation? Um, well, that's the thing. Uh, the things that he uh, loves are space. He's in right. the space. Yeah. So we've got some space books, and we've told him to go to his room, but he doesn't always want to do that when he's in his yes. meltdowns. Something that has, um, we, we didn't have this so much with Anna, but with, with one of our other ones, if um, they were sort of having a meltdown. Because see, with children, they can't always, as adults, sometimes we have somewhat of self-control, right? But with kids, sometimes they just, that's it. They just act out, right? They're on yes. the floor. They're, they've lost it. Just grabbing them in a, extremely tight hug um, for as, as long as it takes for them to eventually you feel their body start to relax. Yeah. Um, and uh, w with Anna, that really didn't help. <laughs> but with one of our other ones, it would. Even yeah. though at first she would, she would fight it, but just in a, just a tight grip, a tight hug, yeah. and just until they're... Um, until their body relaxes. Um. Okay. And that too, I, I would say, like, I would encourage you to, that that's where, because um, yeah, I'm, I'm by no means a trained professional or a, 
so I'm just kind of speaking from my own experience here, but you know, whereas like a, your family doctor perhaps might have some good advice about say the particular thing of, you know, um, being a, say really focused on a missing letter, right? And um, so I would encourage you to maybe speak to, to some people who are maybe more trained in, in that area. Um, well, that could probably speak mistake, into that. It's not a big deal, but if somebody else, else makes, makes a mistake, mistake. <laughs> yeah. it's like the end of the world. Yeah. You know, Armageddon has just hit the house. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I've, uh, I've done it where I've had to hold them down before. Yes. Uh, and then the wife's getting all anxious and she's like, this isn't helping. <laughs> Don't just let him be. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's. So, it's it's hard. It's hard to sometimes know uh, what to do, especially in the moment of yeah. perhaps their anxiety attack or their um, their acting out um, as a result of their anxiety it can be a real challenge. And that's where prayer too. I oh man, like it, it makes you very dependent upon the Lord, where you just cry out, Lord, I don't know what to do. Help, <laughs> help me. And and praying over them as they're going through this, right? The power of prayer just. Praying for them um, is important. Yeah, just a comment. Um, so you you knew the triggers um, from mm -hmm. your daughter. Mm -hmm. um, just also as parents, being super aware of um, changes that can happen to your kids from trauma that parents might not be aware of. Yes. And just being in tune to changes in their character or their yeah. sleep patterns, um, so that you learn to have um, yeah good questions, asking them good Absolutely. questions to see like what may have happened because if something traumatic did happen to the kids often that's right they will try to deal with it their own way which is by burying it as opposed yes. to telling it especially yep. when it's shame connected yes so just being mindful of like the changes in your children yes that you might not understand that's right like going there with them yeah i think that's very yeah that's a very good point that if you know suddenly they they always you know were a good sleeper and suddenly they're not sleeping right or they're not eating or suddenly stomach aches, headaches, right? Because like, like you said too, sometimes it's very physical, right? And so as parents being aware and, and asking questions, and that's why I started with that too, like you got to be open. Too much of this in the past has been sort of, you know, we don't talk about it, right? We've got to have these open conversations. I think I'm ready. Yeah, feel free to write more questions too. I think too. the one thing too quickly is like, yes. that we struggle with is our one child he picks his face when he's anxious. Oh, so I notice yeah. that when he comes home, he'll have uh -huh. like new scabs where it's bleeding. Yes. So when he was too young, we couldn't under, like I didn't get it. Yeah. And then now I see him starting to do it more. So I'll say to him like, why'd you pick your face mm -hmm. today? He's like, well, I caught myself and I stopped. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't tell us. He'll just internalize and then start picking yeah. or his fingers, he picks his fingers. So it's difficult because they're like I don't know if it's different with boys, but they have a hard time communicating. Yes. What and then they just put it shit yes. down, right? Yeah. So I find sometimes parents hard to draw that yes. out and yeah. talk to them. Yeah. Maybe as they get older, it gets easier. It's easier. Mm -hmm. But I know, it, and sometimes too, it's it's just it, you think you find something that works, but then the next time yeah. it doesn't. That's sort of the the nature of children, right? You. <laughs> um. So I I know like with Anna, it would be like. I kind of had to find like, okay, she really needed to be alone with me. Had to be more, you know, if she was going to open up, um, it would have to be in a relaxed, you know, like let's just get cozy on the couch, like kind of thing. Whereas, you know, I have another child who doesn't matter where we are, what we're doing, she'll just tell me how she's feeling. So <laughs> um, I think, yeah, it's to try to find and to pray for wisdom that the Lord would Help me to be able, like, help me to find a way to help my child, you know, um, be open to, ex to explain what's causing them the fear and anxiety. Yeah, and you, for boys, a good thing to do is go for a drive. Ah, yes. Something physical, something, too. Something physical. Right. Like, where you're yes. Doing something else yep. Something. Yes. Something I try Sports. with students <laughs> who are, like, hesitant or are having a hard time communicating is I would be like, Sometimes, like, I remember when I was in school, I'd feel really nervous about a test. Do you ever feel that way? Yeah. And then they can say yes as or no. opposed to, like, finding mm -hmm. those words. Yes, that's a very good point. Sort of asking yes and no questions in a sense. Yeah, it's not. Rather than making, really, yes. not really yeah. to do that. So 
much when you're yeah. counseling because you want to give them I that know. space. But sometimes that's what they need. Yep, right? exactly. If they can't articulate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think we are out of time. So I don't want to take up all your coffee break. But um, yeah, if any more questions, feel free to write them down. And um, thank you for thank you for coming. Oh wait, sorry, I have a handout. <laughs> this um, is an article written by the pediatrician that I um, was referring to, and she wrote an article. Um, <coughs> regarding um, overcoming anxiety. And this will be attached to the children's book that I wrote, which will be coming out, which is a book sort of designed for you as a parent to, to, read, to read with them and to help you go through some of these steps together about the truths of God's word um, and how to completely apply it. But I thought, let me give you this article today, just as something, um, something that you can take with. And she has some very good, um, very good advice. Do you to take some in hand? Sure. Um, and some and some practical practical suggestions. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> If anybody wants an extra one to like give somebody, feel free to come and get. Feel free to get more. Coffee is ready in the church overflow, so head over there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 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 Thank you.